In the first 13 minutes of 1981's Raiders of the Lost Ark, we're introduced to one of the most iconic heroes of all time. This sequence, bearing no relation to the main plot, essentially shows us everything we need to know about our protagonist, shows being the key word. He's daring, skilled, knowledgeable, but naive. Of the 14 lines that Indy speaks in this sequence, only one of them needs to stick. I hate snakes, Chuck. I hate them. Most of what we learn about Indy's character is conveyed visually, as Steven Soderbergh noticed in his exercise of removing all sound from the movie. Blocking plays a hugely important part in this, whether it be having Indy emerge from the shadows to suggest his roguish nature, or setting the villain Belloc above him outside the temple to demonstrate their antagonistic relationship. Alfred Hitchcock once said that filmmaking of this kind, where visuals take precedence over dialogue to convey information to the audience, is the purest form. More specifically, he was referring to silent cinema, an era in which exaggerated action and stylized performances compensated for information which a few intertitles couldn't fully provide. Though the advent of sound film led to a greater reliance on dialogue, the approach cultivated by these directors of the early 20th century left its mark. So, with films that harken back to a classic period in cinema, with a rich blend of action and slapstick comedy, is any wonder that Indiana Jones makes for such a good silent era hero? Indiana Jones was famously developed as America's answer to James Bond, a charismatic, brave and bold action hero called upon by his country to thwart the forces of international evil. He of course carries some of the personality of a cinematic twin Han Solo, but at the same time George Lucas wanted to evoke the feel and look of classic adventure serials and movies of the 30s and 40s. It's hard to deny when faced with his silhouette of wide brim fedora, leather jacket and coiled whip, the influence of such heroes as Humphrey Bogart's Dobbs in The Treasure of Sierra Madre, or Douglas Fairbanks in Secret of the Incas, and especially Alan Ladd in 1943's China. But there's something at the core of his character, and of the films he appears in, that undercuts all this. Indiana Jones is a clown. On paper, he's an over-eager university professor, probably headed for a midlife crisis, who carries a whip, for some reason. He aspires to the image of a swashbuckling adventurer he encountered as a teenager, while in reality, he falls short of this. Indy's character was always a hero that was in over his head, so he was always getting himself hurt and in trouble, and you know, he wasn't quite up to what he was supposed to be, you know, what the old classic Republic serial hero was. Even in that opening sequence, his trusty whip, an iconic part of his persona, fails him. His hat is purely aesthetic, a part of his superheroic alter ego that becomes a gag in itself as he clings to it for dear life throughout his adventures, to the point that we fear for his safety whenever he's without it. He's not the only cinematic hero to be so famous for wearing that particular item of clothing. The silent era's brand of American hero, embodied by Charlie Chaplin, Harold Lloyd and Buster Keaton, may not have been as recognisably heroic or hyper-masculine as many of Indy's contemporaries. Their stunts are not so much intended to be adrenaline inducing as they are funny. They're down on their luck men with a goal in mind, and not the means to achieve them. Chaplin's tramp has to get by on his wits and charm, hoping to win over the girl. Lloyd's Harold character similarly strives for success against a string of unfortunate events. But it's Buster Keaton in The General that best exemplifies the kind of hero that Indiana Jones honours, not conventionally fit enough for the military, which he hoped to join in order to woo his beloved Annabelle Lee. Train operator Johnny Gray is inadvertently drawn into the American Civil War when Annabelle Lee is kidnapped aboard a runaway train. Keaton's action sequences are based around accidents and near misses, rather than triumphs of strength and skill. Compare Keaton chasing a train on foot to Indian pursuit of the truck carrying the Ark of the Covenant. I don't know, I'm making this up as I go. Unlike James Bond, Jones isn't an agent of the state in these films. While he's enlisted by the CIA to recover the Ark, we can assume nothing more than that they paid for his plane ticket. He doesn't have the resources of an upper-class MI6 agent. Besides, you know what a cautious fellow I am. Instead, he relies on his personal motivation, sheer hard work and luck to get him through. Despite this, he takes his fair share of pratfalls. A core part of the breathtaking stunt-based sequences is the palpable danger faced by Indy as a lone agent against powerful regimes. The most memorable set pieces of the Indiana Jones films revolve around the interaction of the organic, represented by Indy, and the mechanical, being his opponent and surroundings. Henri Bergson, in his book Laughter, 
identified mechanical behaviour as a core facet of humour, as human actors are juxtaposed with the inorganic, and often reminded of their own mechanical nature. In the Indiana Jones films, man-made contraptions betray their users. And Indy succeeds often by exploiting their weaknesses and defying their functions. Spielberg constructs his set pieces more like Rube Goldberg contraptions than battlefields. Indy's solutions to life-threatening problems are therefore more often than not sources of humour, played for laughs. These silent era inspired elements are present right from the first film, while its aesthetic more strongly evokes the serials of the 1930s and 40s. When Marion is captured, Indy's pursuit of her intersects with his quest for the Ark in the hands of the Nazis, just as Keaton's Grey in The General has his personal goal of rescuing Annabelle Lee complicated by a Civil War plot. Temple of Doom initially seems to channel James Bond as the main inspiration for the character, while the introduction of Short Round creates a more comedic family dynamic, reminiscent of Chaplin and his adoptive son in The Kid. But it's in The Last Crusade where the unique combination of influences that form Indy's character becomes crystal… especially clear. In the opening sequence, a self-contained adventure like the prologue to Raiders, Spielberg and Lucas take us back to 1912 to witness the first quest of a teenage Indy, outside the period that supposedly his character is most indebted to. As young Indy flees a band of grave robbers for hire, a train becomes the stage for the set piece. The train is the ultimate form of mechanical environment for a set piece, having both a limited area and time span for the fight to take place in, remaining in constant motion like film reel itself. It's been associated with cinema since projectors started rolling. So having this be the formative experience of Indy where he dons the hat for the first time in defiance of his dad, who actually is James Bond, Junior. presents him as a continuation of this classic brand of action hero, one that is wholly dependent on the finite constraints of what's on screen at any given moment, with no extra tricks up his sleeve, one that is just as simplistically clownish as he is daring and adventurous. 